Good morning, good afternoon, and hello. My name is Deirdre Watchorn. I'm head of the Insights team at De Gruyter here in a very cold and snowy Berlin here today. I'd like to welcome you to the latest webinar in our series entitled Challenging the Stateless Quo, uh, Taking Libraries into the Future. Um, and this, in fact, will be the last webinar in our series for 2023, but do look out for more topics coming up in 2024. Okay, so back to the title slide. I'm really looking forward to today, today's panel session, as I hope you are, all are, in which our speakers are going to explore the realm of artificial intelligence and examine the pivotal question, does AI herald doomsday or a new golden age? Our three experts are going to scrutinize the role of AI in a contemporary university setting and address the long-term implications. So thank you to all of our speakers for sharing their expertise and time and to the numerous experts who supported this webinar series. We really do appreciate your contributions. Before we get started, as ever, there are some house rules to refer to very quickly. Um, everyone's video and audio is already turned off, so no need to worry about that. We welcome all of your questions. So as soon as you have one, please type your question into the chat. And we do hope that there will be plenty of time for the panel to answer all of the questions. This session will be recorded and the recording and slides will be emailed to everyone by my colleague after the event. Now I'm going to pass uh, the baton on to our moderators, Linda Bennett and Annika Bennett from Gold Leaf. Linda and Annika, I'll leave it up to you to introduce our esteemed speakers here today. And I'm really looking forward to a lively discussion. Thank you very much, Dee. Um, I'm just going to ask Annika to introduce herself briefly because Annika will be the person who um, coordinates the chat and, and looks after um, the questions. So she won't actually appear on the screen after this. So would you just like to introduce yourself, Annika? Yes, hello. So I'm Annika. I work for Gold Leaf. So Linda and I have organized and set up this um, webinar. And yeah, as Linda already said, any if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. I will kind of file them um to the to the um panelists. Um and also I'm in the background and the person looking after technology. So if you have any problems with joining or or hearing us or so, then please send me a message on chat and I'll try to solve it. Thank you. So before I introduce the first speaker, um, I'd just like to say that we have been very fortunate in getting a world-class panel of speakers today. Uh, they're all renowned for being experts on artificial intelligence in their own fields, and we are incredibly grateful to them. And our keynote speaker, Dr. Andres Gudemans, I hope he won't mind my telling you, he actually has COVID, but he has still joined the webinar, for which we're hugely grateful because I don't know how we would have managed without him. Um, Dr. Gudemus um, is a reader in intellectual property um, at the University of Sussex and the editor in chief of the Journal of World, World Intellectual Property. Now, I first heard him speak at the London Book Fair. Um, and one of the things that he said, which really endeared him to the audience was, he's actually been working in artificial intelligence for um, 10 years. And it was a little kind of backwater topic that no one was interested in. And then suddenly it became sexy and he was a world famous person. So Andres, would you like to build on that? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, very kind words and the uh, and the lovely, uh, lovely introduction and, and for the uh, invitation as well. This is, um, oh, sorry. Um, um, I'm 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 hoping um, this is going to be a a, a good very quick introduction. Uh, yes, um, I've been thinking about this for ten years, and and it, it it's really bizarre that all of a sudden I, I, um, I had been writing and forty people had read one of my papers, and then all of a sudden my uh, um, statistics for citations started shooting up uh, very recently. So uh, it, it's been fascinating to, to find that. Now, um, I, uh, we're probably not going to get a lot of time. Um, I always start my presentations with an apology. Um, usually the apology is that 
I am just an academic that has been thinking about this subject and it's extremely sometimes detailed and geeky on, on, on some of the copyright related aspects. Today, um, uh, as uh, as Linda mentioned, um, I am uh, I have COVID. I've now had it had, had it so many times that I, I stopped counting. Uh, uh, so I'm not feeling that bad, but I am definitely not at the top of my game. So and that is the first apology. <clears throat> if in case I start spluttering and and coughing. Um, now, um, one of the reasons why I always start with this apology is that. Um, this is such an interesting topic, and depending on where you look at it, you can look at it from a very detailed perspective of, of, of a, let's say, an academic like myself, looking at this very detached and sitting in my desk and writing articles about the law, and co specifically copyright law, which is my area of speciality. Um, but also, this has become a very hot, very contentious, very important topic for the reasons we're going to discuss during today. So I know that generally speaking, I, I, I tend to try to be very detached in this. I have my own opinions about what's going on, but um, it's sometimes very difficult to to have that. So please do take that into consideration when uh, I'm going to speak. Most of my experience in this topic has been just as a researcher. I don't have any skin in the game, if, if you want to call it like that. Um, I If the machines come and, 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 and try to destroy us tomorrow, I'm probably going to say, OK, well, that was that. Um, but uh, I, I I don't have strong opinions on on, on many of these things. Uh, that is sort of the first thing. So a lot of my thing thinking has uh, let's say uh, academic, not practical relevance. And why I'm saying this and repeating this is precisely because I may be telling you things that are not nice. Um, there is no nice way of getting around that. So I always warn people, uh, don't shoot the messenger. Now, why I'm saying this is um, also, it's also important to sort of look at this um, as a regulatory perspective in different areas of regulation. And I, lately I've been trying to think about this on how does artificial intelligence fit in the entirety of uh, internet regulation and technology regulation in, in, in general. We've had different eras whenever there has been a new, very uh, big invention or technological change, we've had a regulatory response to it. The early web was an example. People forget that the early web was uh, full of litigation. There were about four years when everyone was getting sued who had any internet presence or they were internet service providers. At some point, we came to an agreement that we were going to restrict the liability of some of these intermediaries. So we were able to have companies that can provide us with, uh, with internet without being sued out of existence. Uh, the same thing happened with file sharing. Um, for those of you who were around in the 2000s, 1999, next, uh, uh, with the... Um, I was going to say Netflix. Um, uh, um, you can tell my brain stopped working. With all of these uh, file sharing and peer-to-peer, -peer, LimeWire and um, Grokster, uh, and all of these things, we also had a, 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 about four or five years of legal strife. And then we came up to uh, with some liability for facilitators. Um, as well. Then we had with the rise of user generated content, again, about four or five years when lots of companies that were providing and facilitating user generated content were getting sued. And we also came up with some rules for platform liability. Some of them are very, very recent. What I think is going to happen with artificial intelligence is that we're going to go through the same process of about four to five years of, uh, of, of, of strife, of legal strife. And I'm telling you this because what has been happening with artificial intelligence is that things are accelerate, uh, accelerating. So in 2003, we have the first predictive text. Then we have Siri in 2011. 
sorry. Um, then we have uh, natural language processing in 2013, um, GANs, which is a very, very important development in uh, generative uh, AI. That was 2014. So uh, uh, diffusion models, uh, what most image uh, uh, generators are based on now in 2015, 2017 transformers, which are very important for uh, large language models. Then we start seeing in 2019 generative uh, pre-training GPTs, GPT-2 in 2019. And in 2022, we have stable diffusion DALI mid-journey GPT. And in 2023, we've had the explosion as well. Search Incorporation, Adobe Firefly, GPT, Bart, Claude, Lama, Grok, Lawsuits, North Korea, South Korea, Marilyn Monroe. Apologies for the very bad um, uh, Billy Joel joke, I hope. Some people will understand it. Now, where the, that come from, comes from, I've dated myself right there and then. Um, so what is important and why, what is happening and what I want to stress in this part, because I won't have enough, enough time to go into a lot of detail on what the regulation and, and particularly the copyright aspects are going, is that we are starting to see that we're going to be living and already living in an AI world. Um, we are starting to see AI in almost every aspect of our lives, and that is from our computers, search engines, open source tools, our phones. Now, if you have a Pixel phone like myself, you can erase people out of existence. I did this very recently, and I felt a little bit dirty. Like I had a, I took a photograph, and there were some people in the background. It was in Iceland, and it was a beautiful setting. And there were, oh, I'm going to erase those people, and it's a little bit creepy so you could say but it's now capable and all of this is powered by artificial intelligence and we have it in search engines is now on office suits if you are using adobe photoshop is now pretty much an ai app so we're starting to see this at every aspect office tools and all sorts of things um and we are not prepared i would, I would probably say that we are not completely prepared because this took a lot of people by surprise, particularly regulators. So really this happened and this started happening, uh, accelerating last year and this year. And this is just going to continue accelerating. And um, I keep saying that um, what we have is that the genie is out of the bottle. So uh, I, I keep using this analogy and apologies if people have heard of this before, but you know, uh, the, the genie is out of the bottle, so all we have to do is negotiate uh, the three wishes with the genie. And of course, everyone knows that this is uh, genie stories are usually uh, cautionary tales where the genie always tries to cheat you and uh, the genie always wins. So uh, that may be something else to worry about. Particularly in my field in academia uh, and, and the universities, this has been like an explosion. This dropped like a bomb. Um, it's, um, it's, it's important to think ChatGPT was released one year ago. Uh, th that is the other thing that we, we really need to, to, to start thinking about all of these technologies and, and developments and how quickly they have been. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, so um, at least in, in university, what has happened is um, everyone, I, I think that not a lot of people know what to do at the moment. We we are trying to get to grips with what this is going on, what, what, what is going on. Um, I, I've had so many meetings on what we're doing and how do we detect this. Um, students are using this. There is no way around this. Uh, students are already using the technology. So... One of the things that we have to, to, to get to grips with is how we are going to go forward. Um, I think that the essay is dead personally, but uh, we still have to, to use essays, but I just, I don't rely on essays anymore, uh, to be honest, because um, the detection, sometimes you can, you can see if an essay has been written with artificial intelligence, sometimes the voice, uh, and, and it's very bland, it has, it has a voice, um, but none of the tools that we have to uh, 
recognize artificial intelligence use are reliable. So at the moment, we have rules against artificial intelligence use in essays. It's personation. It's person. That means you didn't write the essay yourself. However, um, we don't have the tools to adequately detect it. So uh, usually my solution has been to tell the students, okay, do what you want. If you can write a good essay, uh, my standards are going to get, be higher. Um, if you can write a good essay, good on you um, uh, with artificial intelligence. But I would also warn them, these things are pretty bad uh, at, uh, with facts. They hallucinate all the time. And if you're just going to rely on artificial intelligence, we're probably going to fail because also the essay is probably going to be very bland. So that's, that's some of the things that are happening. And mostly this is because we have to recognize the fact that this technology is already here. It's widely available for free or very cheaply, and it's getting very good. Um, so what I've been doing personally is using it in the classroom, uh, sort of use it like a Vox Populi, Vox Populi um, type of thing, sort of the person in the street uh, opinion, uh, get the, the, the lowest common denominator of an opinion. So that's how I've been using it. And also treating, uh, 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 treating or, or teaching people how to that this is uh, pretty unreliable. In fact, this is a language tool. So most uh, most language models are are very good at language, so uh, you, we can start using them. Uh, so another area that interests me, uh, which is publishing in general, not only the university, is um, so um, what we're seeing is uh, very interesting things, uh, particularly for for for. Uh, also for academic publishers, um, that large language models are trained on large amounts of copyright works. There is no getting around that. Um, they can be trained on public domain data, or they can be trained on uh, Creative Commons or other uh, uh, some rights reserved works. For the vast majority, they're trained on copyright works. So for publishers and for copyright owners and copyright creators, uh, we have to keep that in mind. Um, how does that affect? So for example, um, there is definitely going to be jobs that are already being lost or are already being affected. I think translation, this artificial intelligence has the, the, the first people to fall, I think were translators. Um, I, we used to joke about Google Translate until actually we stopped joking about Google Translate. They got really good really quickly. And now you can just press a button and it trans and you can read documents from all over the world. And the translations are pretty good. So translation, copy editing, I think it's probably going to be the next, if not already. Um, if I was a copy editor right now, I would probably be looking for another uh, job. I'm sorry. If there are any copy editors here. I told you, don't shoot the messenger. Um, uh, um, so um, it, also it can reduce costs in some areas. Um, again, probably uh, at the cost of some people's jobs. But also there could be potentially new opportunities. People are going to become prompt engineers. Uh, they're calling themselves that. People are, or AI whisperers. People who are really, really, really good with artificial intelligence may actually become the new job of the future where you can get the AI to do something, do it cheaply. So again, uh, potentially, uh, but also there's a big challenge that we're all going to be competing with very cheap or free products. That is in literature, in music, in art, and in almost all of the creative industries. In, 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 in all everything, it doesn't have to be good. It just needs to be cheap. And that is one of the problems. So one of the ways, and I'm just going to gloss over the copyright thing because this is not really a copyright talk. Um, now, there are interesting aspects of copyright that have been happening here. Um, and we have sort of three debates going on at the moment with copyright. So this is my area of research. Um, I'm just going to, as I say, say, gloss over it. Um, 
First is the, the very important question, are AI generated works protected by copyright? So whenever you use an artificial intelligence to create literature, music, art, or something, uh, is that in the public domain or not? Um, the other one is the training of an artificial intelligence infringing copyright. That is, if an artificial intelligence is using your works, um, it's, if your works are being used in the training, is that going to be copyright infringement? Spoiler alert, we don't know. Uh, there is uh, 18 cases going on right now dealing precisely with this question. 18 lawsuits, uh, actually 19. One was uh, filed, I think, in the last few days. Um, and if so, are the outputs that you produce with an artificial intelligence infringing copyright? So these are two different questions. Uh, what, this is a, what the input question and the output question. The input question is, is all of the data that is being fed into the systems infringing copyright? Or is it you, when I, will you create an image uh, using this art or create text uh, using an artificial intelligence, are you infringing copyright? So these are two different subjects, potentially. Uh, in, in the first one is the company doing the training, your Google's open AI, stability AI, all of these other companies. Um, with the output question <clears throat> are um, you, or also the company that is providing it, but potentially it could be uh, you as someone that creates or generates the outputs. Now, this is where I'm going to run. Uh, on the authorship um, question, there are three possibilities. Only humans can create copyright. This is a standard. So uh, all gener AI generated works are in the public domain. Um, you could recognize that uh, machines can create works subject to copyright protection. Um, uh, so who should get the rights, the user or the programmer? Or we could create something that is called sui generis rights. We could create a right that only works for artificial intelligence it works. We already have this in some countries. So I'm just going to go br very briefly on this. Uh, countries deal with this uh, different ways. US mostly, it's in the public domain, it's not registrable, it's not copyrightable. Uh, in the UK, we have a... Uh, 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 a rule that allows some works to be considered to be where the author of a work that has been generated by a computer can have copyright. It, it still needs to fulfill the uh, originality requirements, um, uh, but it, it gets a sh shorter protection of 50 years. Uh, in Europe, you have to prove that your work is your own uh, Intellectual creation reflects your personality and also reflects your free and creative choices. And in Ukraine now, they have a, 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 a system. Uh, so I'm not going to go through the, uh, other than this is very, very, very important. It's Andres, you've got about important. three yeah. minutes left. Is, is oh no, uh, I, was, I was just going to, uh, yeah, thanks very much. I was oh, just sorry. going to, to wrap. Yeah, thanks. I was just going to wrap up. So yeah, sure. this is, um, the authorship question is very important because this is going to determine whether or not if you're using AI at any point, all of the images that you have seen have been created on me. Do they have copyright? Do they not? I think if I create them in Paris, they don't have copyright. If I create them in um, in the UK, maybe. Uh, so so it's, it's an interesting question. But also it's going to determine whether or not we are going to be competing with free works. And this is a very important question, and we need to get this right. Um, I don't know. I, I have my own opinions. I think that potentially uh, something like sweet generous or some form of protection may be useful, but uh, this is open. Now, I'm not going to go through the input question and the output questions because that these are very detailed copyright uh, nerd questions. There are some exceptions and limitations that could apply to all of these things. I just wanted to finish with this. Uh, we have, an, um, I put 18 lawsuits and counting and it's already outdated, it's 19 lawsuits and counting. Um, uh, everyone is getting sued, everyone is suing each other, uh, some very big names, George R. R. Martin, Sarah Silverman, um, a few artists now uh, uh, have joined the fray, um, Mike Huckabee, um, you, Authors Guild, Universal Music is now suing a, a company. So everyone is getting sued. 
and we don't know what's going on. Um, some cases are already being made and decided, and we have a few first decisions that are dismissing some claims and allowing others, but we don't know. We don't know what's going to happen. So I wanted to, to conclude with this. We have lots of, case, of cases. We have lots of lawsuits. Um, we have no idea what's going to happen. Anyone that tells you that they know what's going to happen in the next five years is lying to you. I have no idea. I am starting to see some direction of play in some of the cases, but still too early to tell. However, I think that the technology is here to stay. We could knock out OpenAI, Stability AI, uh, Google, all of these companies that are training AI, we could knock them out of the business, of business tomorrow. And this would still go on because we would have companies in other countries. We would have open source artificial intelligence, which is an entirely different question that I didn't even remotely touch. So this technology is going to happen. We have to negotiate with the genie, the three wishes. I repeat this. I keep repeating this because you could get your wish that uh, these companies just get obliterated in lawsuits and this would still happen. So with that, I'll leave you and hope I didn't go too much over time. Thank you very much, Andres. That was brilliant. Um, I should tell the audience, um, Andres' slide deck is much longer than the one that he showed you and he has given you a lot more fascinating information when um, you take, when you um, get the slide deck afterwards. Um, one of the questions, you have had a couple of questions already. Um, and one of them, I think you've already answered, you know, about what's happening in the law. Um, Annika, there was a second question there that looked quite technical. Ah, oh, there it is. Um, I don't know if you can see these, Andres. Um, it's, it's a question that I don't understand, but I'll read it to you. Is it possible for a prompter to obtain a copyrightable output without ex post edition, I mean? You're on mute, Andres. Yeah, sorry, I, I'm, I started coughing and, and, and uh, blowing my nose. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, um, um, that's a tricky one because I think uh, the actual prompts themselves are potentially protected by copyright, um, but not all prompts. Uh, you'll have to meet the minimum standards of protection. Um, I've seen some arguments from US uh, um, scholars saying that it's not protected in, um, that prompts may not be protected in the US. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll leave that to US scholars. I think that in, in European countries specifically, uh, or especially, um, I think that if the prompt is enough, is long enough, I've been getting pretty good at this, if I may um, brag. Uh, I had one of my photo AI photographs published uh, in the New York Times. So I think that's evidence that I've gotten pretty good at this. Um, so I can tell you for sure that some of, my, some of the prompts require quite a lot of skill. And I know copyright doesn't protect skill, but also I think they're definitely an expression, uh, an intellectual creation that would be protectable. So I think not all prompts, I would, I, would, I would never claim all prompts are protectable, but I think that some prompts are um, themselves because they tend to be quite detailed. And uh, at least in UK law, uh, we protect um, recipes, we protect, uh, we, we protect tartan instructions, interestingly, and also, um, so in, things like instructions can be protected and uh, knitting instructions are protected. So it, it depends on the prompt, of course. I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Thank you very much. I am going to go on to the next speaker now, but are you going to stay, Andres? Um, yeah, yeah, I will. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry you're not well. Um, yeah, so thank you very much. Our next speaker is Dave Puplett, who's the Associate Director of Libraries and Academic Enhancement at the University of Greenwich. Uh, which means that as a librarian, he's much more involved in designing, teaching and learning strategies than most librarians are. Um, and he's been working in the HE sector for more than 20 years. Um, 
I should add that he's a glutton for punishment because I've already wrote him into doing one presentation this week. That's quite by chance. And now he's doing this one as well. So Dave, thank you. Uh, thank you, Linda. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I'm not gonna repeat the mistake that I made at the first presentation I gave this week, which was to not include a glamorous photograph of a university campus. So I'm hoping that that is coming across um, fully on everybody's screens. Um, so uh, I, I really found um, Andre's presentation fascinating. That one of the phrases that I've been using to try and describe the situation we're all in is that the toothpaste is out of the tube. I think the genie being out of the bottle was much better because you can ask the genie questions. Um, I don't recommend that anyone tries to have a conversation with their toothpaste in the morning. Um, so yes, thank you, Linda. Um, I'm Associate Director for Libraries at, at the University of Greenwich. I'm much more of a librarian than a, a particular expert on AI, but I work in a part of a converged IT and Libraries Directorate. And of course that brings you in contact with all sorts of different uh, application technology in the university and our spaces. And that's been a particular challenge for us as an institution. And that's really the story I'd like to tell you today. Um, so. Greenwich as a university of um, 24,000 students on our campus in the UK. We have three campuses, we teach and research in a really diverse range of, of subjects. And we have a, a, a quite a bold vision for the university, education without boundaries. And the reason I wanted to tell you a bit about the university is that tells you a bit of the background about how we've responded to the, the challenge of AI, which did explode on all of us. Um, for years, we've been saying AI is coming. This is what it's going to be like. I think like so many, we found it hard to really visualize what that was going to be like on a day-to-day -day basis. And that background, I need to expand on. The strategy we have, this is our time. It's got a, a set of objectives of where we want to reach by 2030. And we've got the overall strategy for the university with its, its mission to make us one of the, the, the best universities in the UK, certainly the best modern university, and some strategies that come underneath that. And one of the ones that we've had for since the, the mid 2010s is a digital strategy. And I'm really glad that we had that in place uh, because this wasn't just a strategy to tell us how to run IT. It was to guide how we structure the university, how we support uh, people carrying out their research, the setting up partnerships, how students will succeed. Digital enables people to do their work across every activity in the university. It informs the decisions we make about adopting new technologies, yes, um, but all the decisions we make. The reason I, I, I'm laboring this point is it makes us think about which technologies are we going to adopt? And when we do, how do we implement them? And of course, this applies to, to AI uh, very, very closely. When you break that down, we've said, well, like so many, we're moving away from print processes. We're moving towards digital first. We want our technologies to be not coming up with everything ourselves and then finding it difficult to support them. We'll work with this, the, the market to have excellent solutions rather than homespun things that tend to break. Things have got to be secure. We want to focus on individual experiences so that people don't get lost in the in the mix. Sustainability is really important. And that's the point I want to come back to. Uh, it needs to be part of an ecosystem where everything integrates. Having these principles before we make decisions has proven to be very valuable. There's one I want to elaborate on, which is meaningful digital. I think most of these are probably quite self-explanatory, but what does meaningful digital mean? On a day-to-day -day basis, I think people like to take technology for granted. It just works. Ideally, uh, a level up from that it will save you a bit of time. Higher up the chain, it will give you insights. It will actually not just save you time, but provide you useful information. And for us, the, the, the biggest um, goal would be that it transforms the way we, we work. And I'm looking out the window here at, at, at people doing their work in their offices transforming the education that we deliver and perhaps also the, the way we operate as a business. This is the setup to how did we react as Andres uh, described when that bomb went off when chat GPT suddenly became available to pretty much all of us in some form or another as all of these um, 
tools for you to create your own images became available. What were we going to do as a university? And I, I'm not going to pretend that we were unique um, in, in our response. Uh, I think most universities sat down and, and started asking themselves the question, what do our policies say? Um, do our academic misconduct policies uh, reference uh, AI? Um, do we have a loophole that's going to enable students to, to cheat in a way that we, we didn't already anticipate? Um, so we set up a, a, an extensive working party to make sure we had a, a quick um, response to this. And the result of that was about six months um, work and we got to a, a quite a clear position. Uh, I think there's a similar statement has been reached across most universities, certainly in the UK, but I think across Europe and, and the world. And this is certainly going to change. Um, I think it's it's an evolving situation, and we certainly didn't write this in mind of, of it being a permanent outcome, but it was really important to get something out to give people the confidence to be able to continue to do their work in an evolving um, space. To communicate this out to the university, we also made a, a video so that students and staff would understand what the position was. And I'm just going to play that for you. At the University of Greenwich, we understand that artificial intelligence can be a useful tool to aid in your learning. However, it is important that you understand how it can be used positively and effectively and be guided by principles of academic integrity with an awareness of the risks. All your submitted work reflects your individuality. Your proficiency in written English is an essential skill and an assessed element of your work. You must not copy and paste directly from an AI source. We encourage the use of AI to aid in your assignments with tools such as Microsoft Editor in Word and Grammarly to check spelling and grammar, for example. You can use AI and search tools to locate sources and cite those in your work. Any information directly from sources such as ChatGPT or Bing should be cited using normal referencing conventions. However, we do discourage the use of AI as a source, as factual accuracy may vary. So cross-referencing with established sources is advised. AI can assist you in outlining assignments and summarizing articles, but you should acknowledge this by adding a declaration. It is unacceptable to copy or paraphrase AI-generated content or use paraphrasing tools such as Quillbot without proper referencing or to use AI to undertake analysis, evaluation, or calculations without acknowledgement. You should never enter any personal details as AI systems store and learn from submitted information, compromising intellectual property as it becomes open source. AI's potential is immense and a skill likely to be sought by potential employers, but it's important that you understand how to use it responsibly. Please ensure you understand the acceptable use of AI at gre.ac.uk AI guidance. Okay, um, so I hope that gets across the oops, change. <laughs> the combination of our our principles, the values we held as an institution, and then how we wanted to start embracing AI and give our staff and students confidence about where it was safe to use it and appropriate to use it. So I titled this presentation "The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly." because we'd seen some things about um, AI that were really important uh, and exciting that we could embrace, but also some dark things that, uh, to be frank, did worry us. Um, so that policy gave us confidence uh, where you could use it, um, where we wanted to say to people, you need to declare that you're using it, but if you're not using it, you don't need to tell us. Uh, I've seen some institutions say that you, you had to declare either way. We just said, be, be clear in what you are um, using, and that's it. We've had some suppliers come to talk to us and we've seen that as being quite principled. They've shown long-term thinking, they've been transparent in the ethics around their use, um, the business model they're using and, and the environment, environmental impact. Um, I think we, we do think of these tools as being widely accessible, free at the point of use in a lot of cases, but they do have an environmental impact at scale. I think that's important to be transparent about. And we also asked our students, and I included three quotes here. I won't read, read them out, but I think they're fantastic. These are verbatim, exactly what our, our students told us, what they thought the opportunities are. 
And I just love to see the insight that uh, our students have around these tools. Uh, the bad. Um, for every supplier who's come to us with a, a transparent, well thought through, long term vision for AI in the marketplace, there have been opportunists who have been, frankly, coming to us uh, looking to make some quick money with a poorly thought through plan, uh, which is just, we've got an AI tool and it doesn't make sense. Having that digital strategy uh, with principles has helped us steer us away from uh, making a poor business decision around those. And hype, there's a lot of hype around these tools that's been hard to cut through. Um, and a lot of anxiety has been caused. Um, we are, I, I do agree, I think, with Andre's assessment that the SA, if not dead yet, is on the path. Um, but we're not all the way there yet. We're still using it. And we do need to reassure people about its place in our current assessments. Uh, and, and also um, people who have jumped on the bandwagon and are trying to use it in their job applications, for example. And I've seen some people really come a cropper. So uh, one poor soul had copied in, not just the, uh, they'd used AI tools to help them in their application, but they copied in the prompt as well. And uh, uh, we didn't hire that person right now, the really bad bits. Um, the blandness, so we've seen that too. We, we heard it already today. The, uh, my English teacher, uh, when I was uh, uh, in high school, used to call this the campaign against boring English. I don't think she foresaw AI tools being the bane of, of, of the English writing profession, but we've seen so much text becoming bland and generic, and it, and it really is a danger. Um, I saw a uh, major university press uh, announcing that their word for the year is hallucinate. And this is so important, and especially as an information professional, as a librarian, that what information can we trust in the world when we have massive technology churning out, frankly, quite a lot of nonsense. And then for me, this third one um, was such a critical one to spend a bit of time thinking about. The, the title of today's uh, whole session is about division. And technologies do divide, especially early on in their maturity. There was a suggestion that these are free and easily accessible tools. But I don't actually completely agree with that. A lot of students do not have the funds to license um, full access to these tools, but some do, and they really benefit from that. They get a head start to it. We would quite like to be able to license access to all of our students, some of these tools, if it was safe, but they're not ready for that yet. The potential for the for divide to grow here is enormous. If these tools are trained on data that is biased, and that's very likely, then as an institution that has huge aspirations to close gaps in attainment for different student groups and uh, prioritizes equality and diversity as a, as a, as a goal, as, a, as an institution, will AI widen those gaps? We're very concerned about that. So that's why I've included on uh, the, the ugly side of, of AI as a threat. So priorities for us as a, as a, as a library service, and I think priorities for, for other libraries might be in the future. Academic integrity is clear. It's something we've all been concerned about, and we've actually developed our own course in this area. How to liaise with suppliers and sift what the, the genuine exciting innovation is, um, and not just react to uh, people looking for a quick, um, a, a quick way to make some money in the market how to treat this as a policy and strategy challenge and rather than just a, an immediate technology challenge. I was proud of the way that Greenwich as an institution dealt with this as a, a, an institution-wide working group rather than just which tools do we turn on. We've uh, set up a special interest group of our academic community um, to look at ways we can research this in the future. And I know that we've also joined uh, a network of other universities uh, in this space. And I don't know how I'm doing for time, Linda. I think you're, you're just about out of time, Dave, but if you want to wrap up, that would be great. Thank you. I can indeed now wrap up. So 
Thank you. Right. Uh, we, have, we have got some questions. They're quite complicated questions. So I, I think I'm going to get Swain to go on next and then we'll have all the questions at the end. I suspect that we'll get more questions than we can cope with in this webinar. So I will probably be calling on our speakers to give us some answers after as we email the questions to you, if that's OK. Thank you. So our third speaker is Swain Anna Brigfelt who has 30 years of experience in digital libraries and has mainly worked at the National Library of Norway. And his work has mainly been on digital strategies and um, the Im implementation of large scale digitization projects. Um, so Spain, over to you, thank you. Thank you, Linda. Um, just share my screen here. Uh, so do you see my presentation now? Yes, thank you. OK, thank you for the invitation to speak here. Uh, this will be a slightly different uh, uh, perspective, uh, a more practical. Uh, and uh, I will, uh, through a couple of examples, uh, illustrate that at least our library is going to change due to uh, the introduction of AI. And they are also going to change as in, in our role in society uh, because of the opportunities, because of the challenges uh, um, in, in AI. Um, so uh, through this uh, talk, I'll go through a couple of examples instead of uh, theories, I'll just uh, point at some practical examples from uh, different areas uh, within and uh, uh, outside the, the library. Our library is not a university library, but we are a research library. Um, and we are based on the um, um, law for uh, uh, the deposit of, of uh, information made uh, available to the public. We are supposed to, to collect everything uh, on all med media types, uh, types uh, including uh, the traditional media and also all the digital media. And we are going to preserve that for eternity and give access to everything. We have approximately 600 uh, employees uh, split in two divisions, one in Oslo, one up north where I live. And uh, uh, what is uh, a little strange about our library is that we are doing large scale dig digitization uh, and uh, really large scale. So uh, approximately 170 persons out of the 600 are doing digitization, that is scanning, et cetera. And we have an IT department with more than 70 people in addition to that. So we are very much digital uh, already. In addition to that, we had a role as the language bank uh, in Norway, uh, a bank which is supposed to um, give access to uh, resources for language technology. <clears throat> Based on this, we also have this uh, AI lab where I'm uh, the leader uh, for the moment being, where we carry out experiments and research to uh, provide information to a uh, conversation about AI in libraries and in our library in particular, but also in archives and museums. Um, we have uh, at the moment being five persons in this lab and we are reporting directly to, to the uh, director. So uh, going back to the digitization, at the moment being, since we have been digitizing since 2006, we have now uh, digitized more or less all the books ever published in Norway, more than 80% of all the newspapers. And we have a lot of photographs, a lot of audio and, and other kind of stuff. <clears throat> Our lab then, uh, this small group, uh, we are supposed to uh, basically deliver knowledge. Uh, to uh, both our organization, but also to other organizations to the community. And we do that uh, through uh, carrying out experiments to collaboration with others. We uh, are very active on outreach, et cetera, et cetera. And we do uh, what is uh, pure research as well. <clears throat> now, going to a few uh, examples to illustrate uh, what may be um, the changes for the library uh, on, on a relatively short term, seen from our perspective. And um, to do this, I'm going to, to, to use a, a couple of examples which are real uh, from, uh, from our library. 
And the first one is from the Sami bibliography, where you have uh, an, an office which is supposed to, uh, to document uh, the, um, uh, or to keep a bibliography for uh, publications uh, relevant to the Sami population, which is an indigenous people living in the north of uh, Scandinavia uh, and also Russia. Um, we have a small group of librarians. They are uh, working practical uh, to to do this. They have uh, uh, certain skills. They have a, a long practice. Um, all of this relatively undocumented. <clears throat> and the logistics uh, within this work is is very complicated. So all the arrows here are uh, transport of information of physical items. Um, which you can imagine is, is a sort of a mess. <clears throat> By introducing AI, um, we want to go uh, fully digital and we want uh, uh, more or less all the uh, moving of the objects to, to, uh, uh, to be stopped. And uh, uh, we want the work of the librarians to be more um, effective. And we have done this uh, through training a model on digital content that we have in our digital library and the existing uh, uh, bibliography. <clears throat> uh, in that way, we are using, we, are, we have been able to train a model which is in a, um, at the level of, uh, of the human being able to um, um, propose or suggest candidates for this bibliography. Uh, and present that to the user. So the user has, has now, uh, the librarian has now uh, a new service where um, he or she can go directly to the content uh, based on a, a, a prioritized, uh, prioritized list of, <coughs> oh, sorry, candidates for this uh, bibli bibliography and update our uh, bibliography. This is, of course, uh, um, Good help uh, for our um, our workflow, uh, which is now uh, more effective, and we can also do um, produce better in higher quality. So that is an example of uh, sort of a trivial thing that should be done, could be done uh, uh, more or less everywhere in the library, using AI as uh, tools within the library. The next step is to. Um, to make the library a better place for the user, uh, which is uh, to introduce uh, AI as um, um, as an alternative um, in in the user experience. This example is based on just generating what we call vectors out of content like books or photographs, and then uh, place those vectors, which are sequences of uh, of numbers <clears throat> into a vector space which is multi-dimensional and then uh, compute the distance between those vectors. It may seem um, a little mysterious um, and uh, uh, hard to understand, <clears throat> but it is uh, not more difficult to, uh, uh, than to, to understand the, the ordinary three-dimensional room that we uh, live in. Um, we just carry out uh, a computation without any use of metadata, without any understanding of the content. And through this, we are able to establish um, a service where you can um, navigate through the, um, uh, through the collection based on similarity instead of uh, using metadata to search to find objects. If you have one example which you like or which is in the middle of your interest, you can just start with that and then navigate uh, through the collection. <clears throat> in this case, um, I've used a book which I like very much and I've, I find uh, books which may seem similar to uh, used by this uh, service and it really works. In this case, I'm interested in, in houses based on uh, built by timber 
I have no metadata describing that kind of houses, <clears throat> but I have one example, and I can find a lot of other uh, images based on this. We have made uh, plugins to to enable this service within our, within our traditional uh, digital library as well. Another example of this I found um, just the other day is from the uh, National Library of Luxembourg, which has made use of uh, ChatGPT and uh, introduced ChatGPT as a service within the, their historical uh, um, digital uh, newspapers. In this case, I've asked that, uh, their service based on ChatGPT if uh, um, they can describe the development of the relationship between Luxembourg and Belgium uh, during the 1930s. And this is what, I, uh, what the answer is. What is really good is that uh, this service then, then is anchored. Uh, it points to the articles which um, it has be, uh, based this summary on. Uh, and and I, I think this is really uh, a fruitful, fruitful way to go. Uh, in terms of building services for uh, the user of the library. Um, <clears throat> our first speaker today talked, for example, about uh, the rights and uh, the, the copyrights uh, for um, um, the training data. And what we have discovered during our work is that our collection um, has a great value as training data for language models, which everybody is talking about now. And uh, a couple of years ago, we started up to uh, to study uh, this field uh, and, and and try to figure out if we can use our our digital collection as training data for large language models. And then suddenly, uh, as um, uh, has been pointed out already. Uh, a year ago, we um, we had ChatGPT, and everybody started to talk about and use the large language models. What we see now, of course, is that those models, those services, are really um, well performing. They are general; they can do more or less everything, and they are indeed useful. Uh, and they have quite a few uh, downsides as well, pointing in the direction that uh, there mm, should be perhaps. Uh, with alternatives based, for example, on open source uh, or uh, training of models uh, within uh, a smaller scale in 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 um, various contexts. And what is needed to to do that is just digital content and large amounts. Uh, it should be diverse. It should be relevant, and it should be high quality. Uh, we claim that uh, uh, most of uh, those training models today uh, do not have a, a good control of the of the data, uh, meaning that uh, we also uh, get some <clears throat> garbage out when we uh, uh, when we train on garbage. Um, as you can see, uh, what we uh, need from uh, from a, a training perspective for language models is more or less what we call a digital library collection. Uh, and we uh, just decided to uh, transform our digital text collection into training data. So that is just uh, uh, doing a, a, a slight transformation and adapt, adapting our collection to, uh, uh, to the process of training data. And we have done so and produced what we call the Norwegian um, Colossal Corpus, which is uh, indeed a large corpus of Norwegian text which can be used freely for, uh, for uh, training models. But to verify that uh, the work we do uh, makes sense, we also do training of models uh, and relatively large language models, which we give, uh, give out for free for any use, uh, which also, of course, is a contribution uh, to society and to uh, institutions in, in, in all uh, and we provide those uh, um, uh, to to the public, to the users uh, on ordinary channels. Um, and lastly, um, in 2018, we had a collaboration with Stanford University and, and the library there. And we simply decided that we 
we need an international network uh, for collaboration. Uh, and we um, took the initiative to start the AR Flam, the um, international uh, <clears throat> network for um, AR in in uh, um, libraries, archives, and museums. This is highly active now. <clears throat> and I will uh, would encourage you to go to uh, to the website, uh, take part in the monthly calls, uh, and and see collaboration through this uh, uh, this network of uh, institutions. Um, we have also a yearly conference. Uh, this year it was in in, in, in Vancouver uh, in Canada. Next year in Canberra in Australia. We also have a network for uh, uh, national libraries in Europe, which may not be too relevant to all of you, but for those uh, working in, in national libraries, it, it should be highly, highly relevant. So please have a look at the website uh, there as well and follow the events that we have uh, for uh, that kind of uh, environment. This is um, the AFLM website. Uh, have a look uh, and join the, the community. <clears throat> Now, going back to, to the start, so what we are working on is really to, to uh, change the library uh, to be more focused and deliver knowledge instead of the traditional digital library which you have, which is focused on the data and the information. And we uh, work a lot of uh, positioning the library as a resource for uh, those developing uh, AI in society. I'll skip this one, I think. So this is just a list of things that we work on in our, our small lab. Uh, so as you can see, more or less everything. So please get in touch if there is anything that you would like to discuss or uh, have questions about. That should be approximately 15 minutes, I think. Thank you very much indeed, Sven. And congratulations on taking exactly 15 minutes. That was brilliant. Um, we do have quite a lot of questions. And Annika, can we go back to, there was a question for Dave about um, how to, um, sorry, I'll go further up. There was a question for Dave about how to define um, what original works were. Just quickly coming on, there was a question saying, can you tell us a bit more about the meaning of using AI as a source? Is that's it what produced by AI, AI based on copyrighted works? I think that's the question you mean. And that was for Dave, but I'm, I'm happy for anyone to take that question, actually. I'm happy to start. Um, so I think in the context that we, we were defining that is a bit like Jimmy Wales used to describe Wikipedia, that it's a a good place to start but a really bad place to, to finish as a as a research tool so you you might ask chat gpt tell me about Tottenham Hotspur football club and it will give you an overview of the history but if you then cite that as definitive information that is not a reliable source so that's the advice we're giving to students it it has a place as a tool but it's not a source a reliable source of information and do not cite it as a source i got my information from a from a, a, a chat bot or at all that is not a reliable source of information um, if you use a chat tool um, as a as part of your workflow you need to declare that and explain what you've been doing um, so that's why we we want to say to people they have an appropriate place they have uses but you need to declare whatever that use is, but also do not attempt to reference this as a reliable source of information. And then that opens up the conversation about what is a reliable source of information? <laughs> Andres, do you have anything to add to that? Thank you, thank you, Dave. No, um, it's exactly, yeah. Um, I, I think Wikipedia is a fantastic um, analogy. It's, we always told students the same with Wikipedia, um, which was don't, don't, you, Use it like to get your first references, definitions, or some basic stuff. Um, the same is uh, happens with language models. I think that they are very good, uh, potentially good start to get um, 
let's say a, a definition i've used it a couple of times uh, to sort of uh, particularly if i was struggling with how to explain some technical some very complicated let's say ai terms to um lay audience and actually i that was um a couple of times i used it in, the, in those terms like how would you explain this technology to uh, let's say a uh, um uh, a, a, a school student and it, it provided very nice analogies that were like crayons and and some other things so it, it it works quite well in that respect it can can actually give you some form of of, of a starting point um because i don't think that we should be telling people not to use it it's like the same with wikipedia i think it's it, it's a very very good good uh, uh again uh, good reference um if they write their entire essay uh, based on the information that they got on a, a language model, I think that's that's a big problem. Um, it, it is they're starting to get a little bit more um, accurate, I should say, um, particularly the ones that are able to browse information directly from the web. Uh, but yeah, it's still it's still mostly unreliable, unreliable. Thank you. And Sven, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it's uh, it is really important to understand what a lang language model is. Uh, so in itself, it's just an um, uh, a thing that is shaped by the uh, uh, the content it is fed by. Uh, it is not a copy of uh, that information. Uh, it it just uh, learns to um, to mimic uh, the things that uh, it has read or seen. Uh, and normally it, it, it is not able to uh, um, to replicate or to pres present what it has read or learned. Uh, it is just it can just continue some conversation, some text, etc, and produce text. So in that sense, uh, they are really uh, unreliable. Unreli and this means that uh, technically spoken, you need a lot of things around those models uh, to make them usable. And those things around uh, the models are really hard to understand and hard to understand uh, how they sh should work. Altogether, this means that uh, people just have to doubt everything and they have to check more or less everything uh, if it is important to rely on the information. Um, Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, um, both Dave and Andres touched on essay writing, um, which I think is a bit of a hot potato. I mean, obviously, essay writing has been one of the traditional vehicles for student assessment ever since universities were founded. Um, but I'm going to read this question out because I think it kind of hits the nail on the head. I'd be interested to hear more opinions about essays as a tool for assessment. Writing for us for now is also about training them to express themselves more concisely in their second or third language, which is usually English. For that, we still want to use essays, but we're not we're thinking not just about judging the end product, but the process of it. So how does it? AI or the use of it or the, or not allowing the use of it fit into that? Andres, since you're the academic. Um, oh, for assessment, I am the the it, they're great at summarizing. So um I am afraid I am afraid. Uh, I, I, I don't want to rule it out, but I'm I'm afraid of um that at some point you're going to be presented with uh, 100 essays and you're going to go, oh, let's pass them through ChatGPT and get a summary. I don't know. Um, it's starting to get a little bit uh, scary about, uh, part particularly with large workloads. Now, um, personally, I use them lots for summarization uh, in my own work. Um, usually in trying just to um, get things for class preparation sometimes i take an article i've already read the article but i want to sort of a very quick summary 
uh, that I can put in my notes for for lecture, for example. And this is fantastic for that. So so that's that's sort of where I would use it. I don't think that for assessment uh, we're we're there yet. Um, I would be afraid of that. Thank you. And Dave, I know that Greenwich has, it's already well down the route of not using the essay as the main vehicle of assessment. Could you describe what you're doing instead? It, it really does depend on the on the subject. Um, we're, we're asked this question a lot. So we have an academic enhancement team who give this advice to academics who, who, who are grappling with this question. I mean, there isn't a, a a, a, sorry for the the phrase, a textbook answer to this. It, it does depend on the nature of the, the module and the course that you already have and, and, and what, it, what skills you're looking to test, what the, um, the outcome for your students needs to, to be. So we've been asking quite difficult questions of the, the program leaders who are already in situ uh, because the, the, the original question here is a really, really good one. It might be that the process of writing the essay is the thing that you actually need to to focus on because they're developing the skills as they go along. Um, it's the assessment itself that the 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 moment of the examination that is actually the difficult thing to to set up because it's just so vulnerable to someone exploiting that with the technology, and that's the bit that you need to work around. But if you rebalance the focus on of assessment, all being loaded to that final moment and you break it down into small bits as you go along then you, you avoid that that issue um, but also it's about engagement with your students as you go along um, it, most students don't want to cheat um, they don't want to just get to the end result as fast as they can they want to learn they want to learn those skills as they go along then uh, and that's actually what our academic integrity um, uh, act, uh, integrity matters module has been all about um, we find that some people are only going down this road because they, they're under horrible time pressures and they make a bad choice. So we're trying to engage our students around the conversation all the way through every stage of the degree course. Thank you. And I'm, I'm not going to ask Wayne that question because I know that um, he doesn't teach students or isn't at an institution that teaches students in that way. But Wayne, we have a specific question for you, which is, um, GPT trained on the library collection, does that work by using an API or a custom version of chat GPT? Uh, <clears throat> so that, that's kind of an implementation question which uh, uh, can be answered in, in any direction. You can do everything. So examples of what we do then uh, is that we uh, we give, give out our collection in the in the form of, of training data, and, and uh, whoever it is uh, may train their GPT model based on on, on that collection, and then they they will ha have their own um, model, right? Or uh, OpenAI, for that sake, uh, could harvest our our uh, collection, uh, which the parts of the collection being open, uh, and have that in there. Um, um, as training data in their model, and then uh, that would be available through the APIs at, uh, at um, OpenAI. And we train our models, which we also uh, give access to through APIs and for uh, download of the models. So there are uh, all the flavors that you can uh, think of uh, in this. Thank you. And now I've got a question for Spain and Andres. So we'll start with Andres. What are the copyright implications of using library collections for training LLMs? Um, is it only items in the public domain that are curated by libraries that can be used? Andres. Oh, fantastic question. How, how much time do we have? Um, no, uh, <laughs> honestly, it, it, it depends on, on the collection. It depends on your jurisdiction as well. Um, um, it if it's in the public domain, so the collection, the works are in the public domain, um, you don't need to worry. Um, also, if it's very old collection, some other rules may start kicking in, like uh, uh, orphan works. Mm, there is a, there are directives on, uh, on on orphan works where you can make some assumptions uh, depend, depending on some works. But most importantly, um, 
in uh, the EU in general, but also in, in, in the UK, uh, because of course we're no longer in the EU. Um, you have exceptions for training uh, data, that's a text and data mining exception. And there is a specifically one for research purposes. So as long, I think that most uh, training um, of an LLM in, in a library context with your own collection would fall under that definition for sure. And that is both in the UK, there is a, one exception in, in, in the UK specifically for research institutions. Uh, and that usually includes GLAM uh, ga galleries, libraries, uh, archives and museums, and um, in the EU specifically for research. So uh, most of the time you will be fine. Please, this is not legal advice, otherwise it would come with a bill. So <laughs> do consult your lawyers. Thank uh, you. If that's uh, the case. Just, just to clarify, orphan works are works with no copyright owner or where the copyright no, owner. Um, no, orphan works are works uh, that we can assume, uh, assume that they're still under copyright based on, uh, on the date in which they were published, but where you cannot find who the author or the publisher is anymore. The, usually, um, either people whose uh, relative who died without relatives or, and, and there is no heirs, uh, or um, it could be companies that no longer exist. Uh, nobody knows who the copyright uh, is owned. So there are some some ways uh, you have to uh, to do so to take some steps uh, in collections like that. Um, some some steps to sort of uh, look, I've done as much as I can to try to find who the author of, or the owner of this is. Uh, so there are some some provisions there, but most of the time that wouldn't even matter because um, the text and data mining exceptions would kick in. That is very different in other jurisdictions, uh, particularly in the US, it's being litigated right now. Thank you. Spain, do you have anything to add to that, for that original question about Copyright. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, it's very interesting, and then in fact, you are working very much on on that field, uh, both uh, from a, a technical point of view, but also from uh, the more rights point of view, uh, and and trying to understand the, the complexity of this. Um, so the the more uh, simple answer in practice is to uh, um, to first first of all focus on. Um, uh, all the content out of copyright for some reason out of copyright uh, being old or um, uh, or maybe other rules kick in, kick in uh, in our case. Uh, in addition to that, we make agreements, uh, specific agreements to make um, uh, parts of the collection. For example, for newspapers available for machine learning. Uh, and right now, the the um, we have decided to carry out uh, sort of a study, training models uh, with and without uh, um, content uh, in copyright, and try to measure the difference in performance of uh, in this um, uh, between those models. Uh, and this is uh, in co uh, co collaboration with uh, the government and also the copyright holders. Uh, again, to get to produce knowledge, to produce uh, understanding, uh, which should uh, be fed into the conversation about this. Thank you. So I think we've actually, um, we've had most of the questions um, and some of these are comments. I will, I will make sure that you get them all. Um, but I think to wrap up, um, Andres says the gene is out of the bottle. Dave says the toothpaste is out of the tube. Um, and we've heard that Rishi Sunak and President Biden both say that the human race is about to destroy itself with this artificial intelligence. Of course, we all know that politicians have their own reasons for saying things. But um, Dave, I'm going to ask you all this, but starting with Dave, how do you see the future, Dave? Do you think the human race is on the brink of destruction because of AI? What do you think is going to happen next? Um, I, I'm a really big sci-fi um, fan I have been all my life and I've always thought that the um, future that exists in Star Trek The Next Generation is the future that we're going to get to um, but kind of worryingly the, the, the future in Star Trek does go through some sort of enormous rapturous world war um, where the human race does have these really difficult moments uh, and technology is 
part of that. There is horrible risk in this sort of technology if we don't control it and stay in charge of it. Um, so as, did, someone did ask a question in the in the chat: Is it just a tool? And it, it does have to remain within our control. And, and if we're not careful, then the potential is there for it to do things out of our control. Um, so it, it does scare me. Some of it genuinely does scare me. And I, I think that's where we, we co collectively have to be very, very cautious. Uh, I think as information professionals, teaching people about the boundaries, um, where we can use it to our advantage, what it's for, not to turn a blind eye to it, um, to it, to embrace it where appropriate is, is the balance of, of what we must be doing with it in 2023. Um, um, it, if the world does end because of it, I hope it's long after I'm not here to see it. Thank you very much. And Svein, what do you think? Uh, you, I mean, you've, you've given us some very practical reasons why AI is a good thing and you haven't said much about why it's a bad thing, or even if you think it's a bad thing. So what do you think its long-term impact is going to be? Yeah, in fact, I think uh, a good reason for us to work with um, AI is that uh, it, uh, it seems to be a relatively bad thing. Uh, it, it has the potential of uh, um, uh, being very dangerous for society, uh, and, and especially because... Uh, um, because of the speed of the, de of the development, which is uh, insane now. Uh, and I, I, I doubt that we as human beings are able to keep up with that speed. Uh, the other thing is that, uh, as we have seen as an example of now, uh, the, uh, the large companies, uh, especially American and, uh, and Chinese, have more or less a total control of the te technology, which is dangerous in itself. Um, and they they keep up this speed. They they feed uh, the the environment, producing the technology with insane amounts of money. <clears throat> and so, what we have seen with the open AI um, the, the last days, uh, with uh, the director going and coming back. Um, with the power of uh, the large companies, that is, is really scary combined with <clears throat> what we see in the technology itself. So, uh, sadly enough, I'm relatively pessimistic. Well, thank you, because you came across as very upbeat. <laughs> thank you very much. And Andres, we started with you. Would you like to wrap up? Yes, um, I am also, like Dave, uh, a science fiction a fan. Um, I, I, one of my favorite writers is Ian M. Banks, and he wrote a series of novels on, uh, on the culture. The culture mm -hmm. is uh, this utopia in which uh, art, uh, artificial intelligence lives together with humans and other yeah, aliens. The Wasp Factory. Uh, yeah, uh? The Wasp Factory. Yeah. Um, and um, uh, and sort of the, the culture is is well, it could be a utopia. Some people would say we were the AI's pets, you could say. But um, one of the very interesting uh, parts of that is precisely that artificial intelligence enables us to live in this utopia. Um, some people call it uh, uh, space communism or different versions of that, in, in which abundance and labor uh, are no longer an issue and uh, AI does all of the work and we just live our best lives. I don't know if the, if we're ever going to con to reach those stages, but I think they're tools. And I've been trying to be optimistic and I'm, I'm a very optimistic person. Um, I, I like to think um, that things are going to work out and um, hopefully um, the machines won't kill us. And if, if the machines become sentient, I hope they are listening. Um, <laughs> and uh, but but most importantly, I think that mm, there is potential. There is potential for good here. Um, there are issues that we need to solve. Quite a lot of societal uh, uh, challenges um, with artificial intelligence. But I hope 
that we can probably see this as just another technological advancement. There are that uh, we're in dire need of, of some potential help. Thank you. Well, thank you to all three of our speakers. You've been absolutely stellar. Um, those were three wonderful and quite different presentations. Um, because this is the last um, seminar of the year, webinar of the year, I'd like to thank De Groyter for sponsoring these webinars. Um, I think it's um, a wonderful thing to do to sponsor public webinars and to get people from all over the world engaged in this conversation. I can tell you that there are people from all over the world either listening now or registered for this webinar. So huge thanks to De Groyter. Um, De Groyter is planning another series next year, as, as Deirdre said. Um, and in the meantime, I'd like to wish everybody who's listening and everybody, all our speakers, of course, for a very happy break. I think nearly everyone's going to get a break at the end of the year. And I'm sure everyone feels the need of one as well, particularly you, Andres. I do hope you get better soon. So thank you. Thank you. Can I, can I just, before everyone leaves, just uh, extend my thanks to the speakers as well. Thank you, Sven. Thank you, Andres. Thank you, Dave, for taking part today. Um, I hope everyone has enjoyed listening and then food for thought. There's certainly food for thought for us as a publisher as well. And obviously, thanks to the, the brilliant moderators, Linda Bennett and uh, Anish Bennett as well. Um, to everyone who's registered, you will get a copy of the presentation, the slides and the recording at some point um, next week when, when Andrea, who runs the, the webinars, will be back. And until then, as, as Linda says, um, have a nice Christmas. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you all in 2024 with the next round of webinars. Thank you. Thank you, Georgie. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.